All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to the conference organizers for having us. We're excited to be here. My name is Christian Langalis. And I'm Logan Allen. And we work on Urbit, which is a new computer. We work at a company called Tlan, which is leading development on it, but not the only one. Yeah. All right. All right. So what is Urbit? So Urbit is a project that stems from the fundamental intuition that the personal, com the personal computer was an important uh, step towards digital sovereignty, but it was not the final step towards digital sovereignty. So in the same way that people in the 1980s couldn't imagine computers in every home, we think that there will be personal servers in every home as well, and that the personal server is the next large uh, step in our quest towards digital sovereignty. So what does it mean to have a personal server, and what do you need to actually get that? So we've divided the project into two main categories, which is Urbit ID, which is our address space, so network addresses, kind of like a DNS or IP replacement, and the OS itself, which is a complete replacement to Linux-based systems that prioritizes peer-to-peer -peer apps and uh, individuals owning their own servers. So to break it down, an Urbit ID is a human pronounceable ID and a human pronounceable uh, key that lets you unlock that uh, ID and actually log into your Urbit and manage your assets. So an example of one might be Ravmel Ropdil. So it purposefully is, doesn't sound like any like normal human word that has meaning because it's supposed to not leak your information in the same way that a phone number doesn't leak your information when you give it to someone. So Urbit IDs are scarce so as to prevent Sybil attacks. So there's about 4 billion Urbit IDs, which is exactly 2 to the 32. And the reason why we picked that is more or less because you have to start with some arbitrary number and you want there to be a scarce address space such that people that are trying to buy up large numbers of addresses to use them for botnets or something along those lines have a financial disincentive to DDoS other people, et cetera, because you could just cut off the uh, connection to them and say uh, this person is doesn't have a good reputation and thus you can more or less cause them to burn their investment if they actually misbehave on the network. So, Urban IDs are distributed by a sponsorship tree, not a single centralized entity. So despite the fact that Urbit was uh, developed initially by um, a single company, it is at this point, I think there are something between like 5,000 and 10,000 address space holders. And these people hold like blocks of address space and can distribute it uh, and run infrastructure nodes. So, the Urbit ID system also specifies the structure of the network. So uh, similar to DNS, uh, there are multiple layers to the system. So in DNS, for instance, there are root servers and there are 13 of them. In Urbit, there are uh, 65,000 plus uh, servers that act as infrastructure providers. And then uh, 256 above that, that act as a layer to coordinate those like uh, infrastructure providers. So the OS itself is a totally new computing stack. So you can run it as a virtual machine on Linux or Unix-based systems. So I run it on my MacBook, for instance. But you don't have to. And you can make hardware that uh, computes the uh, assembly language of this operating system by itself. So why, did, why, would, why would someone want to uh, replace Linux? Well, Linux is 50 million lines of code just the kernel. And that's kind of insane. That's like starting to get to the point where it's the size of the human genome. And when you start doing cybersecurity research in a similar way to the way that biologists study the human genome, you know that something bad is happening and that you need to figure out what's gone wrong. So, Urbit OS is written in Hoon, a strictly typed functional programming language. So, Urbit is more secure by design and is significantly simpler. The kernel is built to compile itself and to be able to compile new versions of itself and replace itself without ever stopping running. 
So when you're doing OTAs, there's no need to reboot or anything along those lines. You can receive completely new kernel definitions over the air. And the, the fact that it is strictly typed and functional gives you a lot of security guarantees that you wouldn't be able to get if you were pushing around byte streams and memory pointers. So Urbit OS has a peer-to-peer -peer networking protocol built in, which makes it actually easier to build apps that are communicating peer-to-peer -peer than you would be able to build apps that are uh, built in a traditional client-server architecture. So the point of this is that we're trying to make it easy for people to run a personal server so they wouldn't have to worry about security or operations costs. And we also want to make it so that the default of developed apps is that they're developed in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And also want people and communities to be running their own code and owning their own data such that they're not beholden to platforms that can control their speech and that can also uh, monitor them and provide advertisements, et cetera. All right, so thank you, Logan, for the general overview of Urbit. Now, I'd like to take a, mi a minute to explain how does this relate to Bitcoin? You know, why is, why is Urbit talking at a Bitcoin conference? And so one of our key ideas is that we would like to have money be a primitive at the operating system level for, for development of applications. So we make the operating system, but we don't want to make our own currency. You know, everyone in the Bitcoin community has made Bitcoin into a, a truly workable sound money, and we want to implement this and incorporate it into our operating system as much as possible. And it should be accessible uh, in like money as, a, as an abstraction should be, should be just as accessible as something like HTTP or the file system. And so uh, going farther, you know, why are we talking at a lightning conference rather than a, uh, you know, a general purpose Bitcoin conference? Well, we think that lightning will be the way that most people end up interacting with Bitcoin uh, as, as they get priced off of the main chain. And so we think that Urbit actually is, is uniquely suited for this use case. Uh, there's many affinities that we'll talk about, such as their similar network architectures. Uh, and so uh, there's, uh, there's several affordances that Urbit can, can bring to the new economic systems of, of the Lightning Network. Uh, so as, as Lightning scales up, we, we think that Urbit can really help in several ways. And I'll now touch on uh, several problems that we, we've identified and, and how Urbit specifically uh, can, can benefit them. So the first one is it's difficult to run a Lightning node. Why? Because it's just difficult to operate a personal server. Keeping a server online is not something that is very user friendly uh, in, the, in the Unix paradigm. And so Urbit is designed from the get-go to be a very simple to operate uh, personal server such that you know, your, mom, your mom could operate it. Uh, and you know, this is especially, this, this friction is especially painful in Bitcoin when you have stuff like uh, private keys that need to be stored in an always on hot wallet. You, know, you, have, you have additional security concerns more than if you were just operating, you know, an email server or uh, a, a, a chat room. Uh, the UX around channel management is complex and uh, the, the risks if we don't solve some of these problems are, are severe. You know, there, there will be liquidity providers, hubs on the Lightning Network that you don't want to have to trust. You want to be able to use the, the, you want to be able to use Bitcoin in as sovereign a manner as possible. And so you don't want to compromise your data sovereignty or your privacy. And so one of the ways that you can uh, maintain that is by always having your own server. And so because Urbit makes it easy to run a server, it expands the number of possible nodes out there. Not necessarily the number of people that actually run it, but it gives you the tools that if, if push came to shove, you could bring your node online to take control of your keys, your payments, you know, that type of validation. And so we, we think that Urbit can uh, you know, benefit the individual 
that that they can own their they can own their keys uh, and manage their stuff. And then also Bitcoin at large, it can benefit the decentralization by giving this capability to more people. And so the second problem, and this is particular to the Lightning Network, is as it scales up uh, and as as the Bitcoin fee market takes off, the cost to open and then settle a Lightning channel will will go up drastically. And so companies will need to figure out a way how they're going to manage this cost. And uh, we think that if, if we don't have a good answer to this, it will lead to you know, negative consequences like KYC. Simply, customers in general across the payment space, I, I have a, a payment processing company as well, payment processing fees are always hidden from customers. It's not, it's not user friendly for, for paying. So in the same way, Lightning uh, will, will seek to abstract the channel costs from the, from the average consumer. And so you're not going to ever, uh, the users will never want to pay $50 to open a channel or close it. So it will be these liquidity hubs that, that front this cost. But when you do that, they have to then estimate, well, is this customer valuable enough to me to even, uh, to even front this cost? Uh, and so they'll want some type of uh, credit score or like lifetime expected value metric. And so right now, all this, uh, all this data is stored you know, through credit scores that are tied to like, uh, traditional civic identities that you obtain through KYC. And so this is, we, we see the collection of this information as becoming default if we don't have an alternative uh, way of managing reputation. And so Urban ID can actually apply in a very interesting way here where you have a fixed, you have a fixed address that you can interact online under, uh, but it's pseudonymous. So it, it respects your privacy but while still allowing the network at large to maintain a persistent uh, appreciation for you as either a good actor or a bad actor. And so this, this will help us price risk on Lightning Network uh, without, without needing stuff like KYC. So we see this as a, a way that Urbit can help Lightning maintain you know, the presumption of privacy always. So the third problem is that Lightning needs a healthy routing market with strong competition among hubs. So you really want a situation in which, you gotta really hold this thing close, man. Um, but you really want a situation in which there's a strong amount of competition between infrastructure providers within the Lightning space. And it's very easy right now, especially for this market to be very niche and for there to be winner take all effects in which there are a few systems that have the best user experience, the best explanation of why someone would use Lightning, and the best general like channel management flow, such that consumers are, who are interested in this product are routed through like singular solutions. So LMB. that's... So what you really want is you want situations that basically more companies can be incentivized to take advantage of such that there can be good competition. So one of those solutions is for Urbit hosting providers, which Urbit hosting is more or less the equivalent of custodial management of keys in a, uh, in a Bitcoin world, except with hosting you can actually separate your uh, ownership key from the management key, which actually lets you run the server. So you could own the key without actually, and have it be hosted simultaneously without compromising your ownership. But, for instance, an Urbit hosting company would be able to bundle the service of the user paying for their subscription for the person to run the server for them and simultaneously open a Lightning channel for them such that the cost to open the channel was subsidized and hidden from the user as a good UX would expect. Uh, so being able to create similar uh, services, so packet routing or CDN services for these personal servers, more or less provides alternative mechanisms through which people could create profitable businesses that are competing along different axes 
that could relate and bundle uh, Lightning services. So, for instance, if your only uh, if your only mechanism of gaining profit is through settling Lightning channel costs, you're likely going to be I don't know, like having some problems at least in the current day because there's not that many people that are doing it relative to say Bitcoin where there are very, very healthy fee markets. But over the long term, we see that many of these services will likely be bundled such that users won't even have to think about the cost of opening or settling their channels. All right, so what we're working on today, uh, you know, Bitcoin is not yet on Urbit, but it's currently being built. So right now, our projects are having a, uh, a remote Bitcoin node controller that lives on your Urbit computer, uh, putting Bitcoin into your Urbit wallet, and then after that, uh, developing a way to control your, your Lightning node. And so here is a little mock-up of the current, well, the, the top row is the current Ur Urbit desktop, and then you, you see the apps uh, in the, on the bottom left. Those, those are where we see sort of Bitcoin slotting in uh, to, the, to the native uh, user interface of Urbit. And so we, we really want uh, to, to make this clear that Bitcoin will be this, this primitive that if you're developing other apps, like we have a, a chat app, a blog app, if you want to have a... Uh, a Twitter clone on Urbit, where a like to, to like someone's uh, tw you know micro micro thread uh, costs a satoshi or gives them a satoshi. You know there will be there will be a library ready uh, ready for you to integrate that will make it easy to do so. So this is the this is the the vision we have, and uh, we're very excited to. Uh, to invite you to help us build it, uh, we have several bounties out to help build these uh, to help build these uh, libraries. And please find me after the talk if you'd like to uh, help out with that. And so, with that, are there any questions? Logan and I are uh, you know, Bitcoin maximalists, and so we know that Bitcoiners have great BS detectors, and it's a good uh, <laughs> it's a good way that you you. It's a very good risk. immune system. Yeah. Yes. Uh, not not a Bitcoin node that is actually running on Urbit, but a set of a suite of tools and utilities for interacting with and controlling another Bitcoin node that is running, potentially on the same computer or somewhere else. So, if you want to help uh, trust minimization and decentralization, mm -hmm. it would be an idea to port a Bitcoin on this server, on this Ab very absolutely. server. Absolutely, absolutely. So right now you just have a wallet, sort of a hot wallet, right? Just Yes. All right, honestly. But, but you can currently interact with, there, there is a minimal library currently for interacting with a Bitcoin full node that we're making more featureful. Uh, main thing I'm curious about is uh, where you guys are right now and where you're headed in terms of uh, Urbit's like, initial spin up and usability mm -hmm. for the end user. Sure. So the network has been running since 2016. So we've had a we've had a working prototype since 2016. Uh, but currently, over the past year, we've really a uh, year, two years, we've really ramped up the development. And so at this point, the identity system was done and deployed in January, and the operating system and network itself are currently in an alpha state. You can use it today. And I would say that we're just at the point where it's actually starting to be low enough barrier to entry that consumers could actually get started if they're like mildly technical. Whereas before you really had to be a very specific type of functional programmer. <laughs> if I understood correctly, um, the, the scarcity of the address space, especially for the short addresses, is the, is the ground layer for the reputation system yes. in, in Lightning, right? Yes. Uh, to escape, for instance, KYC or de-anonymization techniques. Mm -hmm. um, but it's based on a, so the, the selling of these addresses is based on an auction system, right? Which indeed is fired by a payment system where you pay with fiat, 
right? You can pay with fiat or you can pay with other currencies. So there are currently multiple uh, markets that exist along with uh, like uh, decentralized exchanges, et cetera, where you can actually buy these assets uh, and they don't require KYC. I'm actually not aware of a single solution that does require KYC. So you have more than one uh, marketplace where you sell uh, address space. That's right, that's right. None of them are hosted by the company Talon itself. Uh, but there are independent uh, other companies that are working on this as well. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you guys so much. Please give a round of applause for Christian and Logan.